All right, welcome to our webinar, Introducing the Geo GNS3. My name is John Florio. I work here at Juniper Systems. I'm a product manager and responsible for the Geo and other geospatial products. I've been with the company for 15 years now and have been in this field and working in this industry for a little bit longer than that. I'm working here at Juniper Systems at our location here in Logan, Utah. Juniper Systems, we're a manufacturer of rugged mobile computing solutions. We've been doing this for almost 30 years now, and we design and assemble these products right here in the USA. We're very proud of that. We're happy to be a manufacturer in the US. This picture here, this is our current facility that uh, we opened up a few years ago, adding on to our previous building. We're now at about a little over 90,000 square feet, pretty good sized facility. We do all of our design, engineering, assembly, packaging, support, pretty much soup to nuts, the entire process for our product right here in Logan, Utah. We also have offices in other parts of the world. We have an office over in the UK, that's our JSL office, and offices for Harvest Master and other brands in Europe and other locations. We serve a diverse group of markets. The commonality between those markets is rugged reliability. We build products that serve mission critical needs that have high reliability requirements. We strive to maintain the lowest warranty failure rate in the industry for this type of product line. Our focus when we build our products is on quality and on service. We, uh, we really take pride and try to do the best job we can there, and we've been a ISO 9001 certified facility for several years now. So we're going to talk about the geo. What is a geo? Simply put, the geode is a small, rugged, compact, real-time submeter GNSS receiver. It's designed to interface with your device and your software. So we've been building a geode for a while now. The original geode was built in 2016. The idea was to make a small, rugged device. The nickname for the project was Project Gretzky. And for you hockey fans out there, you could probably guess where that comes from. We wanted to make a product that conceptually was as simple and as rugged and as easy to use as a hockey puck. Now we couldn't quite make it as small as a hockey puck, but we were able to get a pretty small compact device. It was built to give us real-time submeter accuracy of 60 centimeters or better. That's 2D RMS or 95 to 98%. And it works with Windows Mobile, Windows PC, and Android devices. Uh, the corrections available to the geode were SBAS and using RTK cores networks, we could uh, get an NTRIP solution to get a real-time differential GNSS correction. About three years later, we produced the Geo GNS2. This we released in 2019, and what we did with this product is we added on iPhone and iPad compatibility along with Android and Windows devices, modernized the product, and modernized the software we produced for the product. And we also add, added, based upon user request, a battery monitor feature that could appear in the software so you could see how much battery was left on the device. So now, three years later, here we are in 2022, introducing the new Geode GNS3. So the GNS3, it's a, it's a new product that has a new receiver engine, supports many more signals, new channels, new capabilities. Probably its biggest new feature is scalable accuracy. We can deliver submeter, subfoot, or decimeter accuracy. So 60 or 50 centimeters, 30 centimeters, and even eight centimeter accuracy. The product is designed to be available in single and multi-frequency models. It also supports the Atlas L-band correction service. And we've also updated, updated the mechanical design. The geode is designed to work with all of our products, as well as any product that you use in the field. You can use it with our Archer and Allegro products, our Mesa, upcoming Mesa Pro, any smartphone, any Android or Apple iPhone or iPad device. It's a very flexible, open design. The GeoGNS3 provides additional correction service for increased accessibility. Of course, it works with SBAS, like all of our products have, so that gives you uh, correction service in North America, Europe, East Asia, and Australia with the future coming South Pan correction service that should be online soon. 
You can use it with RTK or cores networks using NTRIP as the delivery source to get a real-time differential GNSS solution. And it's also capable of using the Atlas L-band worldwide correction signal, which has selectable accuracy options. And this is useful where SBAS and network corrections are not necessarily available. With these new features, we're able to serve new use cases where we're now able to deliver a product that's helpful for water utility location where higher accuracy needs may come into play. It's useful for agricultural mapping and planning operations and laying out of seed research plots. With the different corrections that are now available, we can use this in remote mapping projects where correction services that we relied on previously were not available. So archaeology research, natural resources and wildlife management applications. And also this is useful in rural population census studies because it's compatible with a wide range of apps and operating systems to use with whatever device you bring to the solution. This is just a quick snapshot of the specifications. I'm not going to go into detail of the specs here, but I will be talking about these throughout the presentation. This is posted so that it's available for you if you download the presentation later. Now a quick functional overview of the product. The geode itself is a little more than a 10 centimeter box, about four inches wide and it's about two inches tall, 50 centimeters tall, 50 millimeters tall, excuse me. On the front, there is a very clean, simple interface. We have one button, that's your power and on off button. We have four LED indicators. Now on the right of, of the product, we have two ports. There is the USB-C port. We've updated the USB port now to be USB type C to make it compatible with most current devices. That's your charging and a data port. And then we also have an external antenna connector for use with an external antenna. We do have some customers that use the geode, say mounted in a piece of heavy equipment, uh, particularly in the logging industry, and they put the antenna up on the roof of the equipment and the receiver tucked in the cab so it's less likely to be damaged although it is a rugged product. On the bottom of the geo, this is where the product label is, and this is also where you would find the serial number if you needed to find the serial number for the device. We also broadcast the identity of the product in the Bluetooth message when you connect to it. That includes the serial number. And you'll notice here in the middle, this is the quarter inch by 20 camera tripod threaded insert. So it will attach to pretty much any device out there, a camera monopod, a camera tripod, all sorts of mounts that we have for shoulder mounts and a handheld smartphone tray. We also include an adapter with the product which takes that port and converts it to the standard 5 8 by 11 JS or survey pole. There's two other inserts to the left and to the right of the center mounting point, And those are M4 size screw threads, the metric thread, and they're spaced to be a standard amps diagonal mount. This is a mount you can find on any diagonal or diagonal shaped RAM mount uh, attachment system. So it's a very universal interface for connecting to things. And on the lower left, you can see we have the nine pin serial port. There are people who still use serial out there. They use the product sometimes to interface with other devices such as ground penetrating radar or sonar and to use additional signals coming from the receiver. We've recessed that port now and we've made it standard on every unit. So the product now sits flush when mounted on a surface. Just a quick note on the LED indicators that we do include a quick start guide, a little card with the product of every unit that ships, which is nice to keep for your operators out there. There's four LEDs, each different color, easy to identify. We have an indicator for power, which shows your device is turned on and gives you an indicator when the battery is low. A charging indicator that'll show when the device is charging or fully charged. A Bluetooth indicator that comes on when you are connected via Bluetooth, and Bluetooth is the most common and primary method people will use this product. And then we have an indicator for the position solution. It'll flash when you have a three-dimensional GNSS position, and when you have a correction applied, depending upon the correction service you're using, it will behave differently. But when the correction is active and applied to the solution, the light will turn solid. So a very simple, easy to use user interface. As I said, the product has a single button operation. Click to turn it on, click to turn it off. 
based on some user feedback, we added an additional feature into the product. Through our companion software, you can do things like reset the receiver, but we've also added that now to the power button. If you press and hold the power button, hold it for five seconds, we'll do a reset on the device. That is a soft reset, which will reset all the messages back to their default settings and restart the receiver engine. If you were to press down and keep holding the button for 15 seconds, that slow flashing green light will turn to a fast flashing light. And when it finishes, it will have performed a factory reset, which resets the almanac and the ephemeris and the internal real-time clock and returns all messages to their default settings. So if you have a situation where a user has been using the product or tried a new application, they may have changed some settings and they're having some issues with the receiver. In the end, they can always do a hard reset. Just press and hold the button and everything returns back to its beginning. A couple other improvements we've made on the product. We did change the design mechanically. You'll notice it is just a little bit taller than the previous geode. It's a little less than half an inch, so maybe a little more than a centimeter and a half. Uh, that was to add a new room on the top to fit the multi-frequency antenna, which we'll talk about a little bit. And the case bottom was extended just a little bit to allow us to recess that nine pin port. Adding that little bit of room, of course, also allowed us to do some things with the hardware design to strengthen the plastics a little bit. It's a very rugged product as is, but we just wanted to tweak it and make some improvements that also help in the manufacturing process. So when you buy the product, what's in the box? Of course, you get the geode, but you also get a 18 watt universal power supply, which has prongs that'll work with US or Japanese outlets, and it includes UK and EU adapters. Now, if you're in Australia or New Zealand, we ship this with a different adapter because of certain regulatory requirements for those countries. We also include a USB-C to type C cable, and this is what we recommend as the primary charging cable for the product. But we also include a USB-A to Type-C cable, so you can interface with any legacy devices out there that require a USB-A port. Of course, the 5 8 by 11 adapter is included in the box, and a quick start guide. We do have an unboxing video on our website that shows you a quick run-through of the product. If you want a little more detail on that, you can go to our website and click on the link. Now, with the product, we also provide the Geode Connect software. The product is a solution, so there's a hardware and a software component. The software is not required to use the product. The software is provided to allow you to do things to the product, such as change settings. It's free app utility. It's available through the app stores, through Apple and Android app stores. It gives you the ability to establish Bluetooth communications, which you can do directly through the operating system, or you can use Geode Connect to click the button and establish communications with the device. It displays all the receiver performance info when the receiver is working. You can see your position, your estimated error, and the type of correction you're getting. It also gives you control over all the receiver settings and the ability to select different correction services. GeoConnect is also a tool that you can use for the delivery of RTK or CORE's network real-time differential corrections through NTRIP by using it as an NTRIP client. And it also functions as a mock location service provider to Android. When using that, you can deliver the position from the receiver to all the apps on your Android device. And on Windows PCs, it also has a virtual COM port feature that allows you to run GeoConnect as a NTRIP client and also have an app connected to another port so it's getting corrections to that application. On iOS devices, when you connect the Geo to an iOS device, it automatically takes over the Genesis position of the, uh, the iOS device and delivers the geode solution to it. In the app, there's also the ability to activate or to apply subscriptions to the receivers. Now, these receivers have the ability to add new features at the time of purchase or any time thereafter. When you purchase a feature such as subscribing to the Atlas Correction Service, all you have to do after you've made that purchase through your dealer, your dealer will contact us and process the purchase, and then we will send back a confirmation. And when you receive the confirmation back from your dealer, all you have to do is connect the geode, the geode connect, and make sure that your device is connected to the internet, and it will automatically install that subscription unlock code and turn on that feature. If you're not able to get online and do that, 
you will receive a confirmation email from your dealer that has the unlock code and you can copy and paste that unlock code right into the software, press the save button and it will be applied to the receiver. And these receiver subscriptions or activations are tied to the serial number for the device so they're not cancelable or returnable or transferable to, transferable to different devices. Although if a product does come in for warranty service or needs to be repaired because it, I don't know, was run over by a front end loader, could happen. Uh, we can repair and replace the product and then transfer licenses over. As I said, there's two models of the GM. There's a single frequency model and a multi-frequency model. Now they look substantially similar, but you can tell them apart easily by looking at the bottom, flipping it over, and you will see for the multi-frequency models, there is a orange label that says GNS3M. And on the single frequency models, there's a gray label that says GNS3S just to make it easy to identify the two. The single frequency model, this is the replacement for the previous GNS2 product. It has all the same capabilities, all the same performance levels with the new improved hardware and the new improved receiver engine. So with this new receiver engine, we do see a substantial increase in battery life. Previously, we had about a 10 hour runtime on GNS2. With the single frequency GNS3, we're now getting about 16 hours of battery life. So a nice improvement there. As far as accuracies, you still have the ability to use SBAS, which will give you a 30 centimeter, that's RMS accuracy, or 60 centimeters 2D RMS or 98%. And you can also use it for real-time differential GNSS with NTRIP and see around a 25 to 30 centimeter accuracy, which of course, the accuracy will vary depending upon your baseline length and depending upon the network architecture you're using. As far as optional activations for the product, you can turn on faster data rates. So if you want to change the data rate from the default one hertz or one bit of data per second to two or five or 10 seconds or even subscribe up to 20, 20 times per second, you can do that. Uh, the only thing to note on the single frequency models because it's built with a single frequency antenna and ground plane, it's not upgradable to multi-frequency or to Atlas High Precision. This product basically replaces the GNS2. Now we also have, we have the multi-frequency model. It has a different antenna inside it. It performs a little bit differently and it's open to more capability. Of course, you can use SBAS and you would get the same accuracy because SBAS works the same way. If you use it with a NTRIP delivery service through an NTRIP network, you get a real-time differential GNSS solution, but it's better than the single frequency solution because of a feature on the receiver called SureFix, which allows it to analyze and use all of the frequency solution, all the solutions from the different frequencies to get a better solution closer to 15 centimeters. And the multi-frequency model can use the Atlas subscription and get 50, 30, or eight centimeter accuracy options there. This below are the different activations and subscriptions you can apply. Of course, we have the 10 Hertz, the up to 10 Hertz and up to 20 Hertz data rate activations. The multi-frequency is an activation. There's the opportunity where you could purchase the unit as a multi-frequency hardware, but not have the multi-frequency license enabled. Some people may do that from time to time, depending on how they want to manage their product and when they intend to use different features, they may buy in the, for future use. We also have the Atlas Basic activation. Now, the reason Atlas Basic is listed as an activation is because activations are one-time features. They're applied one time, they last for the life of the product. Subscriptions are time-based services. So the high accuracy versions of Atlas, the H30, which is 30 centimeters and the H10, which is eight centimeters, you can subscribe to, the, subscribe to these for a period of time, such as a month or three months or a year or multiple years. Here's a simple outline of the various frequency bands for various GNSS services that are provided out there. The GNS3S, again, a single frequency, so it works in the GPS and GLONASS and Galileo and Beto L1 bands. The GS3M also covers the L2 and L5 bands for all of those constellations. The E6 bands are not currently used. 
Here's your accuracy options for the two different models of the product. You have the single frequency model. I'll just show you graphically here. We have SBAS, 60 centimeters, or NTRIP, 25 to 30 centimeters, and the multi-frequency model. We have SBAS, Atlas Basic, which is at 50 centimeters, Atlas H30, which is 30 centimeters. NTRIP, it's a little bit higher on the stack here because with that SureFix engine, it's able to get a better solution. And of course, Atlas H10, which gets down to about an eight centimeter solution. So what's that look like? So here's a picture just snapped from a common piece of software we're all familiar with, Google Earth. This is part of our building, part of our facility where we build the product. It does extend to the west and to the south about just as much as what you're seeing on the screen here. What I did is I just marked an area here on the landscaping over one of the trees out in front of the building. Now the big blue circle here, that's the blue dot you see on your smartphone. That's about a five meter dot, just to give you scale. When you see that dot, you're looking at something you could be 15 feet plus or minus or more from a specific position on the ground. So great for navigating in a car, great for locating some features you want to find if you're out hiking or driving on an ATV. But if you need more detail, if you're gonna perform work and you have to find out where features are on the ground, you're gonna need something more precise. We're gonna zoom in on these circles right here, talk about them a little bit. So here's that big five meter circle. Here you can see a little bit fuzzy a tree. There's a shadow. This inside circle is uh, just a reference to show you what two meters looks like. So that tree is about half that size as far as the canopy of the tree. It's just a little conifer we have out front. Uh, this is what you're gonna get with most of our handheld products, just using the built-in internal receiver. The green circle, that's your SBAS solution. That's your GNS 3S or previous GNS 2. That's what you're capable of getting. The red circle just inside that, that's your Atlas Basic. Atlas Basic is a little bit better than what you would see with an SBAS solution. The inside purple circle, that's H30. That's 30 centimeters. So just under foot. Uh, that's also equivalent to what you're going to get with NTRIP with the single frequency product. And then the yellow circle on the inside, that's the H10 correction, and that's eight centimeters. So that's actually just a little bit smaller than the geode itself. So that's a pretty good size. And, and we've even seen it resolve a little bit better than that. I'll show you that in some data. So let's talk about correction services for the product. What's out there, what's available, how they work, and what you can choose. All right, GPS and other GNSS systems have different sources of error. For example, GPS is specified in the design spec by the federal government who manages the GPS system. The standard positioning service has an estimated accuracy of 10 meters. And then the precise positioning service, which is only available to the military and other select government entities, is accurate to one meter. In terms of the military, one meter is good enough. If they can get an object to a location within one meter, they've achieved their mission. But for the rest of us, 10 meters is a bit large. And along with that 10 meter default expected accuracy, there's a lot of sources of error involved. You've got ionospheric air, which is the high atmosphere. That's where the aurora borealis occurs. That's where a lot of static electricity that interferes with radio signals. Then you have receiver clock errors and satellite orbit errors. There's a thing called orbital, orbital drag. Uh, we also have the troposphere, which is clouds and rain. The receiver itself can have noise inside that can cause some error. And of course, multipath. Most of you GPS users out there are familiar with that. You get close to a building or a structure or some reflective metal object, and you can suddenly see a jump in your position, which is signal bouncing off of a target. The receiver is designed to reject that. The antenna and ground plane in the receiver are also designed to help reject that even more but it can still cause some error. So let's start with the basic correction service, the one that works with every geode receiver that we have out there. This is called SBAS, which stands for Satellite Based Augmentation System. SBAS is a correction service that applies an estimated time offset to the GPS satellite signal broadcast to overcome ionospheric delay. So its job is to wipe out the delay caused by the ionosphere. Its coverage is regional, it's continental. It only covers specific parts of the Earth, such as North America, Europe, 
Asia through MSAS and now available through QZSS, their newer system. Gagan, which is the Indian system and the future SBAS system for Australia and New Zealand. Its primary purpose is to improve aircraft takeoffs and landings, the spacing for aircraft, but we also use it to apply the ionosphere to the receiver. The benefit of that is it, it provides a correction to the GPS data, reducing the biggest source of error. It can take a three to five meter autonomous position and reduce it down to sub-meter. Now it's receiver dependent. Our receiver is capable of doing that resolution, getting down to sub-meter solution, getting down to the 30 centimeter RMS capability. The advantage though is that it's free. There's no subscription, it's provided out there, it's easy to use, and it can tolerate some signal interruption. Once the receiver has resolved and captured that ionosphere model, it applies it to its solution, even if there's intermittent interruptions to various satellite signals. Now the challenges with that though is it's broadcast by geosynchronous satellites, satellites that are orbiting the Earth at the equator. Because they're in a stationary location, they can be blocked by terrain around you as you're moving around. And it has limited coverage areas. It's a regional service provided by different countries in different areas. Also, it only corrects GPS data. It doesn't apply directly to the other constellations. Even though you're receiving those constellations, the SPAS correction doesn't apply to them directly. What it does do is it corrects the time offsets to GPS, which also causes the receiver to update its internal real-time clock. And as the internal real-time clock of the receiver is corrected, that also improves the clock and timing errors that may be associated with the other constellations. Lastly, it only addresses ionosphere correction, so it can only get us into that sub-meter solution. So what if we want better than that? Well, we could use NTRIP. NTRIP is an acronym of acronyms. It stands for Network Transport of RTCM, which is a type of message, by internet protocol. So that's a mouthful. Basically, NTRIP is the delivery service. RTCM is the message type. And NTRIP actually can deliver different message types like RTCM, CMR, CMR Plus, uh, ROX, and there's, a set, there's several others. NTRIP Corrections, it's a protocol for streaming differential GPS data over the internet for real-time corrections. It's based on lo local or regional GNSS receiver networks of continuously operating reference stations. So you have a network of receivers covering a region. Those receivers all communicate together to a network center that calculates the definition of what a network is, which is balancing the position to have an average good position from all those different stations together. And then part of that network is what's called a caster, which delivers data from that network to your receiver. It is primarily developed for real-time kinematic or RTK GNSS solutions. It's designed to remove the need for having a discrete base station receiver. So you don't have to carry a base and a rover, you can use network RTK. In the case of the geode, we use it for real-time differential to get a real-time differential correction source. Here's some examples of some networks. This is the network here in Utah where we're located. All these stations cover all of Utah. We also have some coverage in Nevada, and Idaho, and over in Wyoming. And this network allows us to get a real-time accurate position anywhere within the operating area of this network. Here's another example of a network in the southern US that covers Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico. One of our partners manages this one. Here's some examples overseas. This is for the UK, the Ordnance Survey of Great Britain has a national network that's available. And here's an example of a network in Germany showing all of the reference stations in all the various states in Germany. The point is these networks exist all over the world. They are all using the NTRIP architecture, which is not a standard, but a guideline or a method of delivering corrections, and they all have different structures to those networks. So some things to consider, the benefits are you get high real-time accuracy. It is a local correction service. It's available in most populated areas. With the GNS3S, you can get about 30 centimeters of accuracy, and with the GNS3M and its sure fix capability, you can get down to about 15 centimeters of accuracy. You might see better based upon the baseline length and how well that network is structured. Some challenges though, 
to consider when using NTRIP is it does require continuous internet access. You're going to need a cell modem or you're going to need a, use a smartphone or a hotspot, something to continuously deliver that NTRIP data. It's a subscription-based service, and in many areas, there's an additional operating cost. In some, it's free. But you have to find out in the area where you're working what type of network is available, if it is available, and what type of cost you might have to incur. Uh, there's multiple correction formats, so that can cause confusion. You have to use a format that the receiver will understand, most commonly an RTCM message. It is not as easy to use as other correction services because it does require having some software called an NTRIP client which Geode Connect is, so you do have to have that or have that capability in your software to connect to the network. It's not available in remote areas because these networks are designed to serve large population areas. So in very remote areas, there may not be a network available for you to access. And one last thing to watch out for is these networks work in different datums or different projection systems than uh, GPS, or GNSS, or for example, the other corrections like Atlas or SBAS. Those are space-based global models, whereas local networks use local models. For example, in the United States, all the networks that are available, the reference datum for those networks is NAD83, North American datum in 1983. Well, that's different than WGS84, which is what the GPS satellites are based on. And if you were to go and capture a position with SBAS, and then, without even moving the receiver, change over to an NTRIP solution, and then capture another position, exactly the same physical location, you'll see your points, like here in Utah, those points could be four feet apart. Well, does that mean the receiver is bad? No, does it mean the receiver is not working? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means the data is in a different reference frame, a different datum. Its starting point is different for the coordinate system you're looking at. So you have to be aware of that when using NTRIP. Now, just a point of clarification with the, the term RTK. You probably hear that a lot. RTK receivers are typically multi-frequency, but a multi-frequency receiver is not necessarily RTK capable. RTK receivers require a special RTK engine, which is a math algorithm designed to solve down to centimeter level solutions. The geode is designed as a precision mapping product, not a surveying product. So it delivers a real-time differential solution when used with RTK cores networks. On screen, you might see it display something like an RTK float as opposed to an RTK fix. So again, the GNS3S with its RTK differential solution or RTK float will get you about 30 centimeters or just under a foot. The GNS3M can be almost twice as good as that, getting you down to 15 centimeters or better, which is still quite good for a mapping-based solution, which is what the product is designed to be. All right, one more correction service, Atlas. Atlas is a correction service that's owned by Hemisphere GNSS. Hemisphere manufactures GNSS receiver boards that are used in lots of products. We use a Hemisphere board inside our product, which is why we have access to the Atlas correction service. It's an L-band, which means it's a signal is broadcast in the satellite frequency band, the upper band, which is where L1 is broadcast. It's a satellite-based, global GNSS correction service. So similar to SBAS, it's a signal that's broadcast down from geosynchronous satellites around the Earth. And it provides coverage for most of the Earth, basically from 75 north to 75 south in latitude. So just about everywhere except the Antarctic and the very top of the Arctic, maybe a little bit more than what's shown in this graphic here. It is a paid subscription service. And it has multiple accuracy levels. It's a form of precise point positioning. Now, the benefit is near worldwide coverage. And another benefit is you have multiple accuracy levels. You can buy what you need for the job you need to do. You can also buy for time. For the H30 and H10, the precise services, you can buy a month or three months or a year, just whatever you need to serve the project or the type of work you're doing. And you can change over time if, for example, H30, subfoot is good enough for the work that you're doing, but then you come across a job you have to do, say you were doing wetlands delineation and then someone pulls you over to another project where you need to do location of water valves and the requirement is a higher level of accuracy. You can then subscribe to the H10 service 
and get a more, more precise solution. Also, Atlas is kind of nice because once it achieves a solution, in other words, it converges, and we're going to use that term convergence here in a minute. Uh, once it gets that solution, it can, it can tolerate interruptions. Now, you will see, if you were looking at GeoConnect, you might see your estimated accuracy jump up if it loses signal for a little bit and then drop back down again. That's the receiver's real-time estimate of how accurate it is. It's not a measure of how accurate it is. It's the receiver's estimate. That's why it's called estimated horizontal error. But the receiver, once it has converged and has a solution, it can tolerate those intermittent interruptions. Now, just like SPAS, because it is based on geosynchronous satellites, it can be blocked by terrain. And because it's a PPP solution versus a RTK or CORS type solution, a real-time differential solution, it has longer convergence times. And that's the time it takes to resolve, I'll get technical here and say the integer ambiguity error and the pseudo range errors which is basically doing the math to count how many cycles there is in each signal on each frequency it takes longer to do that with a single receiver than it does for a receiver that has a known location the base and a rover or a signal from a known network and a rover that happens much faster because you have a local network in the case of atlas you have a global network which is much larger and it takes longer to do that math. And of course, it's subscription-based, so you do have some additional costs to think about there when you're trying to choose a correction service. Okay, so how well does Atlas actually perform? We're gonna just show you a little bit here of some testing that we've done just to give you a feel on the product. So this is some testing we did of Atlas H10. On the left side of the graph, on the vertical axis, this is the estimated horizontal error. We have two meters at the top, one meter in the middle, down at the bottom, I have a green line here that's 10 centimeters. Just don't want a simple number to describe H10. Reading left to right, this is just number of seconds. And I've grouped these into little blocks for five minute chunks. So when you turn on the receiver and you select Atlas as the correction service, and you have a subscription active, the receiver is going to try to figure out where it is and what that correction is. And initially it might say, I'm only good to about two meters. And then it's going to drop down pretty quickly to about a meter. And then you see it starting to resolve or converge and get better and better over time. And after about 30 minutes for an H10 solution, we're down to 10 centimeters or even better. And in this graph, what we did just to test it, we ran the receiver and got a, a converged solution. And then we restarted the receiver and let it converge again, restart and let it converge again. And we did this five times just to get an idea how consistent that value was. And we find that H10 generally converges in 30 minutes or less from a complete restart of the receiver. And we've also found that it doesn't matter if you're stationary or moving. What matters is if you're obstructing or not obstructing the satellite signal. So while you don't wanna sit on a job site spending 30 minutes of your job waiting for a receiver to come up with an accurate solution that meets your parameters. What you can do is take the receiver and mount it on the roof of your vehicle with a magnetic mount and turn on the receiver and let it start resolving as you're driving out to a job site. And then you get to the job site, you take out your tools and your equipment, you get ready, you connect and you discover, wow, it's already converged, I'm ready to go. That's just a nice little workflow procedure. So we tested uh, H10 a lot because it gave us good reference for the performance of Atlas. And then we also tried H30 and Atlas Basic. And we see the same general performance, but the convergence time is shorter because the solution is not as accurate. We're not pushing it to as accurate as a solution. With H30, we were able to get to a solution in about 10 minutes. That's done to 30 centimeters. With Atlas Basic, in these tests, I saw really about a nine to seven minute solution. That's from turning the receiver on. Uh, I have seen it resolve in four or five minutes to get that 50 centimeter solution. So it can resolve much quicker with Atlas Basic, more similar to what you'd see with uh, SPAS solution. So this is all of that data that I showed you previously, those graphs, and I compile it all into one big chart. It's a little messy, but I'll explain what we have on the screen here. So each of these squares in this graph is 10 centimeters or four inches. In the center is the true position where I had the receiver mounted. And 
inside the orange circle is everything that was within, that had converged within 50 centimeters or better. Inside the blue circle is everything that had converged within 30 centimeters or better. And inside the green circle is everything that converged within that eight centimeter accuracy range. Well, in this instance, I drew it to 10 centimeters. But you can see the majority of the data is clustered inside that center position. When you turn on a receiver, initially it doesn't know where it is. You might see these little gray dots off to the side. You see the position jumping around a lot. And as it gets the solution, it starts to get better. And it gets tighter and tighter, comes into your true position. So that's an example of what Atlas can do over time. All right, so we talked about different correction services, but how do you know which one to use? Which one, if you're a, a, one of our dealers, which one do you recommend to your customer? Well, you have to think about what type of work they're trying to do, what type of solution you're trying to achieve. All these corrections are available depending upon how you configure the receiver, but you may want to use different ones based upon different use cases. So they're all real time. SPAS is regional, NTRIP is regional, Atlas is L. L-band is worldwide available. SPAS is free, and TRIP could be free or might have a subscription depending upon where you are. And this is actually a nice feature to use, and it's a way of uh, saving money for a customer where they can potentially use this service, particularly in those regions where it's free. And then Atlas does have a subscription fee. But I'll tell you the benefit for that, just as we get down the row here. Uh, the accuracy with SPAS, you're gonna get 60 centimeters with NTRIP, 30 or 15 with the multi-frequency. And with Atlas L-band, you have the choice of 50, 30, or actually eight centimeters. You don't need NTRIP, excuse me, you don't need internet for SBAS or for L-band, but you do need an internet connection continuously for NTRIP. So you have to factor in that need, that complexity, and that cost if you're gonna use this as a service. So if there's a subscription for NTRIP, remember there's also a subscription for your cellular service. So which one is best? Well, they're, they're all good. They all do different jobs. SPAS is like our GNS1 and GNS2 product. It's the lowest cost solution. It gives you sub-meter where it's available. Essentially, if you need to dig in the ground and you want to make one scoop with a bucket, maybe you might have to make two scoops, but usually one scoop will do it. SPAS is the solution for you. You're planting a tree, that's a good tool. If you need more accuracy than that, you need to think about NTRIP or Atlas, and then you have to look and see what's available where you're working. Where local networks are available and you need increased accuracy, NTRIP is a great solution. If you are working in a remote area, we have customers in Southern Africa, and there is a bit of a network available to them in some places, other places they don't have it. And for our customers in South America also, where there's not a lot of coverage, Atlas is a great solution to give you coverage in remote areas, and you need increased accuracy. So just a quick review of some of these use cases. For example, you live in the United States or say maybe Europe, and you need to capture sub-meter data for a mapping project. What do you need? All you need is a single frequency geo to GS3S, and you can use WAS or Magnos in Europe, or in Asia, you could use MSAS or QZSS, and get a free correction service and get sub-meter accuracy. Great, you have a solution, you're ready to go. You can also use the GS3M, multi-frequency geode, and still get that SPAS solution. So either receiver, any receiver we make will do the job. Now, say you're in the US and you have access to a local network, you want know, an NTRIP uh, access to a uh, RTK reports network. Do you need Atlas? You don't. You just need a single frequency or a multi-frequency geode and a way to deliver that network data. You can use Geode Connect or other apps that have NTRIP client capability. And you need to make sure you have uh, connection to a cellular network. What about if you live in South America? Can you use a geo? Sure, you can. If you're working in a remote area, uh, you can use the GS3M, and you can use the Atlas Correction Service to get submeter, subfoot, or decimeter accurate positions without a base station or other network access. So that's where Atlas really comes into play is for those remote locations when nothing else is available or you want something at a certain level of accuracy that you can reliably get to. And you're traveling around maybe, say you're going from state to state or region to region, and you don't want to apply to multiple NTRIP networks to have those subscription fees, you can have one subscription fee for Atlas and cover many areas. Okay, what about someone who say lives in the USA or Canada and doesn't have access to a local network, but they need 10 centimeter accuracy. Well, what do they need? 
they'll need a multi-frequency geode, the GNS 3M, and they'll need a subscription, subscription to Atlas H10, and they'll be able to achieve eight centimeter accuracy. The subscriptions are available for the amount of time you need to do the work. You don't need to buy it once and forever. You could buy it for a month or three months or a year, or if you want to buy it for extended period of time, you can do that also. All right, one more thing. What apps out there work with the geode? Simply put, nearly all of them. The geode outputs NMEA messages, which is the universal standard for most GNSS solutions out there, particularly in the mapping world. So it works with just about any piece of software out there that can read NMEA messages or any operating system that can understand NMEA GNSS traffic. It works with our Uinta mapping app, uh, and it works with many different apps for iPhone, iPad, Android, and Windows devices, including ArcGIS Field Maps, ArcGIS Survey 123. Uh, you can use it with Carlson Serve CE or Serve PC. That's a really good one that uh, it's kind of interesting because that's a survey based product, but also has a lot of neat GIS features in it. There's a product called Global Mapper that you could use. It's also a great GIS engine, separate from the Esri products. I have to be careful, I don't want to name any one product and forget someone else who's out there, but I know that we have a lot of partners that use a lot of different solutions. Um, I can't even think of all the names of all the different products out there, but there's so many that work with the products, such as uh, oh, Effigis is on PAW software, and uh, there's a really great utility locating software out there too. We have these all listed on our website. If you are an app developer and you want to get your app to connect really to the geode, we can provide you that information. And particularly if you're building apps on iOS, you have to get those whitelisted with our receiver. That's part of Apple's process. Just contact us and we can do that. And if you go to our website, you can see all the apps that are already whitelisted along with the instructions on how to do that. So in closing, I'll just wrap it up here and we'll get to a couple questions that people have posted. Uh, the GeoGNS3, it's the latest in a line of successful and reliable all-in-one professional mapping grade GNSS receivers manufactured and produced by Juniper Systems. The new Geo GNS3 delivers the accuracy you need depending upon whatever job you're doing. It's a new scalable and upgradable receiver that can adapt and grow with you. Now, when can you get one? You can order them today. We're producing the product. We're starting to ship it out to our dealer partners who have placed pre-orders and as we build more of these, there's going to be more available very soon. So thank you for participating. I'm going to jump over to some questions now. And I'll take a look here at some of the questions that have come in. All right. Looking at the list here. Ah, there's a question about vertical accuracy. That's a good question. Generally speaking, with mapping grade receivers, your vertical accuracy is, on average, about one and a half times your your horizontal accuracy. So generally horizontal accuracy, then you have vertical accuracy, it's about one and a half times that. Now some of that has to do with geometry. You have to think three dimensionally. When you're on the surface of the earth and you're capturing a position, it's easy to get a good horizontal position because you have satellites all around you, a 360 degree circle all the way around you. But vertically, you only have satellites above the surface of the Earth. You don't have any satellites below the surface of the Earth. And in fact, we cut them off at 10 degrees because anything below 10 degrees is dealing with so much atmospheric noise, it's probably not worth adding to your solution. So because you don't have that vertical solution covering you in 360 degrees vertically, like you do have a horizontal solution, the ambiguity for elevation is a little bit more. It's not as good as your horizontal position. On top of that, what's the definition of elevation? Which model are you using for the elevation of the Earth? GPS doesn't measure on the surface of the Earth. It measures on or calculates a position on a mathematical model of the Earth. And then we project it up or down to a measured model of the Earth. A lot of you are familiar with apps out there where you can load what's called a geoid model, which is a gravimetric model of the Earth. And then you apply the elevations from the receiver to that geoid model to offset it and determine what's closest to true mean sea level where you're capturing data. All right. Let's see, what other questions do we have here? Let's see. In the photo, we show the standard nine pin connector does not have a cover. 
Ah, that's a good question. Now, the receiver's ports are sealed, whether the cover is over the ports or not. Uh, we don't have a cover on the 9-pin port, um, but you can take any off-the-shelf consumer 9-pin or VGA port cover that you might get with a cable and slide it right over that connector to keep out dirt or sand or grit, things like that. Generally speaking, our users have not had too many problems with that. We haven't really had anyone send anything in for service where they've had a problem with that port. The ports are sealed behind the connector interface. We just put the covers over the USB port and the antenna port because those are smaller and it's better to keep those clean. Uh, here's an interesting question. Is there any future upgrades to include IMU or Tilt? That's a great idea. I can't promise anything, but it'd be nice to have that in the future and I could see where that would be applicable. Let's see, other questions. A few of those questions got answered through the uh, presentation here. Someone said, yes, we got that. Let's see. I think we covered most of those. So I appreciate everyone who's attended and been able to participate. We went a little bit longer than extended, but I hope we were able to provide information that would be useful to you. We're going to wrap up this presentation. And then if you have any questions, please feel free to email us. You can reach us through our website which is www.junipersist.com. You can send questions to sales at junipersist.com. You can even call our support, support folks if you have any questions or email them. They'll be happy to help you out. Uh, definitely, if you have anything that you need to have answered quickly, please reach out to one of our premier dealers who's out there or any of our OEM partners who have some great solutions with our products and with the products that they produce that are really I think very superior and, and uh, quite professional. But I just want to thank you all for attending and uh, hope you attend in the future. We will have this webinar posted and available for viewing later on YouTube. Thank you very much.